Chapter 2 Taming Infinity with Generating Functions and the Z Transform. In order to solve the puzzle around our infinite grid of 1 ohm resistors, we need some more tools. And hopefully, we can make use of the ones that we learn here. So let's first look at our original problem. So, this is the middle of our infinite grid of 1 ohm resistors. In the middle, we have the voltage U00, but the equations are the same around any point Mn, except that only in the middle we will inject a current. The injected current, mostly zero except for the middle, is always the sum of the current that goes north plus the current that goes south plus the current that goes west and the current that goes east. Where north is, where we increase m, and east is where we increase n. Each of the currents is proportional with a factor of 1 over 1 ohm to the respective differences in voltage. So for example, the current north is proportional to the voltage with an index increased by 1 of um plus 1n minus the center umn. And in the same way, all four currents are proportional to the difference in voltage between the outer nodes and the middle node. Adding up all the four differences gives us the equation that we have to multiply the voltage in the middle by 4 and subtract all outer voltages. So we have a transformation where we multiply each point in the grid by 4 and subtract its neighbors and then we have the resulting distribution of injected currents. Let's draw a simplified grid without the resistors and denote each node with F M N. So here again our equation but with a minus sign and written in F instead of U. This equation is the discrete Laplacian. It is used for example in computer graphics to do some edge detection. If there is a region in your image where the color only changes very slowly, so the difference between the middle point and its neighbors will be mostly zero. But if there is an edge where the brightness or the color changes rapidly, so then this operation will give a high value. The Nabla squared symbol that is used here is the same symbol that is also used for the continuous case. the continuous case, we have differential equation instead of difference equation. If someone tries to simulate the differential equations on a computer, so one has to do this in discrete steps and this operator then appears as an approximation for the differential equation. For our purposes, let's think of it as a linear operator that takes each point, multiplies it by minus 4 and sums the neighboring points. So here I also use the bold L symbol that just stands for linear operator. So in order to solve our problem, it makes sense to learn how to solve difference equations. But let's start with something simpler, with one-dimensional difference equations and not two-dimensional ones as we have in our grid. Probably the most famous difference equation is the equation for the Fibonacci numbers. So the Fibonacci numbers are generated by summing up two elements in a series and then appending it to the series and this way generating an infinite series of numbers. So we have fn plus 2 
is fn plus fn plus 1 and this is valid for all n's but in order to make sense we need to define the starting values. So for n equals 0 we define the value of the Fibonacci numbers to be 0 and for n equals 1 we define it to be 1. From this we can calculate all subsequent numbers. How can we even represent a sequence of numbers in mathematics? So one option would be to use a vector. Another option would be to use a polynomial. So a polynomial has a series of terms 1, x, x squared, x to the third and so on. And each of these terms as a number associated with it and we could use this number to represent the number in our sequence. So the vector above and the polynomial would both represent the same sequence of five numbers 4, 1, 2, 0, 11. One obvious advantage of the polynomial is that we can easily extend it to be infinitely long so an infinite series of these polynomials could be the Taylor expansion of certain function. Another advantage is that it's very easy to represent a shift of the numbers to the right. If we want to shift our numbers to the right, we just multiply our polynomial by x. And then we have x times p of x and each of the terms it gets one more power of x and so shifts one to the right. Shifting to the left is then just a division by x. So since we also have a term with the power of x to the zero here, so we get the term 4 divided by x, so it's strictly no longer a polynomial. But anyway, shifting to the left is easy. And as I said, we can represent an infinitely long series of numbers by declaring it to be the Taylor expansion of some function. We are not actually interested in the function, how the function looks like, we are just interested in its coefficients, because the coefficients are the elements of our series and the function is just a tool to remember these coefficients. In the formula here, so our sequence is the numbers a n, where n runs from 0 to infinity. And this is the trick behind generating functions. We declare a function just for the purpose of keeping track of an infinite series of numbers. Let's look at the simplest of all series of numbers, the series of numbers that is a sequence of all ones. On the green axis, so I have labeled the points, so this means our sequence starts with the coefficient a0 being 1. The red dots mark points with negative indices and normally our sequence will be zero there, but in some cases we can have a few terms with negative indices. So this would be our function. f of x is 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed and so on. Of course our function in this case only converges for x smaller than 1. Geometric series. we can multiply it by x. This shifts it one position to the right. If we subtract the shifted version of the function from the original one, all the x terms cancel and the only remaining term is the initial one. Dividing by 1 minus x on both sides gives us we can see this as a transformation of the series of all ones to the function that represents it, which is 1 over 1 minus x.
keep in mind that the function 1 over 1 minus x doesn't have anything to do with our series of ones, except that the coefficients of this series are the ones that we have in our original series. To our series of all ones is the geometric series. Here we start with one and then half it with every step. So one, one half, one fourth, and so on. Again, we express our functions in terms of x. So x to the zero is one, x to the power of one has a coefficient of one half and so on. So the general formula for our terms in our series is one over two to the power of n. The series is the half of its previous one or fn plus one is fn half. With a very similar trick as we used before, we can find the function f of x that represents this series. It's f of x is one over one minus 0 0.5 times x. Instead of 0 0.5, we could have used any factor between the terms. So we can express a growing or a decreasing geometric series. Series that grows by a factor of c, and this factor is in this case 1.2. Each term is by a factor of c larger than the term before, and again our generating function can be expressed as 1 over 1 minus c times x. Let's assume we have a sequence where we know the terms. So the sequence f of x represents the sequence of numbers a1, a0, a1, a2, and so on. And we know these a's. And now we want to construct a new series, a series of partial sums. So where the first term is again a0, but the second term is the sum of the first two terms. The third term is the sum of this, the first three terms and so on. So each term is the sum of all terms before it. So this is the sequence of so-called partial sums. Is there an easy way we can transform f of x to get g of x? If you want to try it, pause the video for a second and try to come up with the formula on your own. If not, continue watching. Indeed, there's a very simple way to transform f of x to get g of x. We just need to multiply with 1 over 1 minus x. We could have used this to get our sequence of all ones. If we start with a sequence that has only one term one in the position zero, and then we peel the partial sums. So then the partial sums will always be one because it only includes one term that is not zero, that is a zero. And so from this, we can conclude that the sequence of all ones must be one over one minus x. In a similar way, if we want to have the difference of neighboring terms, we just need to multiply the sequence with 1 minus x. How do we get the sequence of natural numbers where e0 is 0, a1 is 1, fn is n? So let's try this. So there are a lot of different ways to arrive at the formula for the natural numbers. So, but the easiest way I think is to just use the method we've learned before to build the partial sums. So if we already have our sequence of ones and then we build the partial sums, 
So these sums will get bigger by one each time we we um, add another term. So from this, you know, it's just a multiplication by one over one minus x. And in order to ensure that the term at zero is zero and the sequence only starts with one at the position one, we have to multiply with uh, another x. So from this, we get the formula x over one minus x squared. Here is the so-called harmonic series, where each term is one over n. So we start with one, one half, one third, one fourth, and so on. So if we write down the formula f of x that represents the terms, so one way to arrive at this is to note that you could differentiate uh, f of x. And if you differentiate it, so then you would arrive almost at the series of all ones. So for this reason, the representation of f of x of the harmonic series can be expressed with a natural logarithm. Because the logarithm is what we get when we differentiate 1 over 1 minus x. So you see our generating functions are not always functions, rational functions of polynomes, sometimes a little bit more complicated, but in most cases we have very simple functions. Generating functions are a really useful tool for combinatorics. Here's just one example. Let's assume there's a game of chance where you blindly draw balls from a bucket. You do not know which ball you get. So there is a 20% chance that you draw a red ball and with the red ball you win one euro. If you are lucky, so there's a 3% chance that you draw a golden ball and with the golden ball you win five euros. But most balls are black balls and with a black ball you lose or you win nothing. So the chance of drawing a black ball is the remaining 77%. The numbers add up to 100%. So there's a 100% chance that you get one of these three balls. We could represent the outcome after one round of drawing balls as this polynomial, the coefficient at x to the power of zero is 0 0.77, representing that we got nothing. The coefficient at x equals one is 0 0.2, which re represents the chance that we get exactly one euro. And the coefficient at the power of x to the five, where we get five euro is 0 0.03, so, which represents the 3% chance of getting the golden ball with 5 euro. So, after 20 rounds, we have f of x is p of x to the power of 20. So, this is a very large polynomial with many coefficients. And from these coefficients, we can read off all the outcomes of our winnings and the probability that this outcome will happen. So doing this by hand is rather uh, hard work, but plugging this into a computer algebra system is very quick and easy. So for example, I did this with the SymPy package, which is a symbolic computation package uh, for Python and building f of x is p of x to the power of 20 gives us, so from reading of the coefficients, we see that there is a 0 
percent chance that we end up with losing all the time. So our final outcome is zero euro. So which means we have drawn the black ball 20 out of 20 times. On the other end, so there is a very, very tiny coefficient at the power of x to the 100, which means we have drawn the gold ball 20 out of 20 times, and we have won 5 euro times 20, which gives us 100 euros. So this is represented by the coefficient at x to the power of 100, which is something like 3.5 times 10 to the power of minus 31. So this could have been computed in a more conventional way very easily, but summing up all the possible paths that, for example, leads us to uh, getting 10 euros uh, or even uh, getting 5 euros. So for getting 5 euros, so you need to sum up the probability that you draw exactly one golden ball exactly one time and uh, all black balls the other time and uh, the other possibility to end up with exactly five euros is to draw exactly five red balls and then the remaining balls all black balls um, so even this could be done very easily but for more mixed up combinations so summing up all the different paths where you end up with a certain number of, of euros could be quite uh, complicated. So the generating function here takes care of all this summing up. With a similar logic, you could use uh, this method to find out how many ways there are to get a certain amount of change. So for example, you have uh, three five euro coins and uh, seven two euro coins and uh, 12 50 cent coins and so on. And then you want to find out how many different ways are there to get, for example, a change of uh, three euros and summing up all the different ways could be done by multiplying the corresponding uh, generating functions. So as I said, generating functions are really useful for combinatorics. But let's get back to our original problem. So why we were looking at generating functions in the first place. Generating functions are really useful to tackle finite difference equations. And the most famous of these finite difference equations is probably the Fibonacci sequence. We get the Fibonacci sequence by adding up two consecutive terms in the series. And from this, we get the third term. So Fn is Fn minus 1 plus Fn minus 2. Each term is the sum of its two terms before. And in order to make sense, we also need to define the first two terms. So in the case of Fibonacci sequence, so this is usually done in the way that F0 is declared to be 0 and F1 is declared to be 1. In order to translate this difference equation into the language of generating functions, we can replace fn with f of x. And we, if we have n minus 1, so we multiply it by x first, so in order that it lines up with the original function. And if it's two steps behind, like the term fn minus 2, we have to multiply it by x two times so by x squared in order so that it lines up with the original functions. Finally, we can add a term p of x, which is a small polynomial that represents the initial 
conditions. So by changing P of X, we could change the initial conditions. Bring the F of X to one side and pulling it out. So we get the formula F of X times one minus X minus X squared is P of X. And from this, it's easy to calculate f of x, we just divide by 1 minus x minus x squared. In our case, we find that we have to choose our polynomial p of x to be x to represent the case where f0 is 0 and f1 is 1. So we very quickly found a formula that allows us to calculate all the elements in the Fibonacci sequence. But wait, how do we actually do this? So one way would be to put it in a computer algebra system. So if, for example, if we use SymPy, the Python symbolic calculation package, we could use the function series and it would spit out the elements of the series. Of course, we can also do a long division by hand. In the end, for the Fibonacci sequence, it's probably easier to just follow the rules for the sequence and sum up this, the terms as described uh, in the initial formula. But there is also a way to transform our generating functions in a way so that we can read off a general formula that directly allows us to calculate any element in the future by just knowing the number n. And this is what we want to try to do now. So this is the generating functions for the Fibonacci sequence. So how do we transform it into a formula for the nth term of the Fibonacci sequence? For simpler generating functions that have only one x in the denominator. So this is much easier. So we already know that this would then be a geometric series. If we have one over one minus c times x, so we would already know the answer. In order to change this into simpler terms, we can use partial fraction decomposition. By choosing some constants a and b, we can satisfy the below formula. So we can transfer on the left hand side to the fraction of a over 1 minus x over r1 plus b over 1 minus x over r2. Where r1 and r2 are the roots of the polynomial 1 minus x minus x squared. So this is always possible. If you are familiar with partial fraction decomposition already, you might have noticed that I have written it in a kind of strange way. So usually the term in the denominator is written as x minus r1 or x minus r2. So here I have transformed it a little bit to look more like the initial generating function that we know that represents the geometric series. But of course you could also write it the other way and then later transfer it into this form by changing your constants a and b. So let's find the constants a and b. First, we need to find the roots r1 and r2. It's a simple quadratic formula. And we find the roots to be minus 1 plus minus square root of 5 divided by 2. So one of these is positive, the other is negative. One is, by the way, the golden ratio. So there are different ways to do partial fraction decomposition. 
the easiest one is the algebraic way so where we just multiply out the the denominators of the two separated fractions and then set it equal to the original fractions from this we find that a is minus b and we find that a and b are 1 over square root of 5. If you are unsure, pause the video here and verify it for yourself. To read off the closed formula for the terms fn in the Fibonacci sequence. So it's just the sum of two geometric series. A term that is smaller than one quickly becomes irrelevant. It's also quite surprising that we have all these square roots of 5 in there. And then still we get natural numbers as a result. Again, you are encouraged to verify this for yourself. Important later on is how we can include negative positions. So in this example, we have our well-known series of all ones, but we also include a term of 1 at the position of n is minus 1, and we include a term of 1.5 at the position n is minus 2. So this is easy to do. We just need to add a few terms x to the power of minus 1 and x to the power of minus 2 and it's quite unambitious what we mean with this. But the situation changes if we want infinitely many terms at negative positions. Then we get a problem. Let's see. So this is a sequence with all ones, but only with negative ends. So this one ends at n is negative 1 and has a 0 at n is 0. It's also easy to write it as a generating function like this. f of x is x to the power of minus 1 plus x to the power of minus 2 and so on. And it's also easy to transform this into a closed form. The closed form in this case is easy to find and is very similar to what we already know. So this is f of x is minus 1 over 1 minus x. Well, actually, for our comfort, it's a little bit too similar to what we already know. Because if we think of a sequence that has only positive indices, for example the sequence of all minus 1, so this would give the same formula. Both sequences would have the same formula and are thus indistinguishable from another. The only way to say which is which is if we also specify the region of convergence. So you can plug in any number of x except x is 1 for both formulas or for the same formulas since it's actually the same formula and if we say well the, the function makes sense for x larger than 1 so then obviously we mean negative terms if we say the formula makes sense for x smaller than 1 so then obviously we mean the lower sequence formula itself we do not know if we have a sequence of of um, values in the negative range of n or in the positive range of n now let's see if this mechanism of generating functions could help us solve the problem of infinitely many resistors in a grid in one dimension. So the grid in one dimension, of course, is rather simple. It's just a line of resistors. All of them, let's say, have one ohm 
and we denote the nodes u0, u1, u2, where u0, u1, u2 would be the electric voltage on each of the nodes. Now, if you are an electrical engineer, you certainly do not need generating functions to solve this problem. If we send in a current, so then this current might divide equally into the left and into the right side, if both sides are infinite. And then the current stays the same forever. So each resistor will see the same current and will produce the same voltage drop. So then this means that the potentials will increase linearly. If we send in a current of 2 amperes, then each side will see a current of 1 ampere and then each voltage drop will be 1 volt and this will mean that the, the voltages will increase by 1 volt in each node. But let's see if our generating functions can do this as well. So the formula here describes the situation. So in order to get the current through each resistor, we'll build the difference between two neighboring voltages, and then this is proportional to the current. And then we build the difference between two neighboring currents, and the difference between two neighboring currents is the same as the current that is injected in each node. So in our case, all of these differences should be zero, except for I n, where n is zero, so this is then the current that we inject, but all the other e n's, that should be zero. Now we could write this formula as a difference equation and translate it into the language of generating functions, but instead we will try to do it even more elegantly and directly work with the generating functions. So let's say the generating functions for the sequence of potentials un is u of x. So u of x represents a function where the coefficients at x are equal to the potentials u0, u1 and so on. creating the difference of two consecutive voltages, so this would be the voltage over each of the resistors, UR, is then just UX times 1 minus X. Remember, multiplying by X shifts the sequence, and then if we subtract the original sh sequence and the shifted sequence, we just get the sequence of differences. So in this way, we have constructed the sequence of voltages over each of the resistors that of course is proportional to each of the currents as all of the resistors are the same. Now we do the same trick again. So we will build the difference of these UR voltages multiplied by 1 over 1 ohm to get the currents and then building this differences is just multiplying by 1 minus x. So remember, these differences then represent a sequence of currents that we send into the network, but the sequence is zero everywhere except at the origin. And from this, it should be easy to calculate u of x. By setting i of x equals to 1, which means it only has one component at the origin. So we get u of x is 1 over 1 minus x squared. And this look, should look familiar to you because this is a sequence that we already know. So this is the sequence of natural numbers, but here only shifted by one place. This sequence starts with 1 at the place u0. But remember, choosing the initial potential of u0 
is arbitrarily anyway. We could have started with any any potential here. So if we want to start this sequence at u0 is 0, so we just would have to multiply it by another x again to shift it. But this, as you can see, gives the right solution. Until now we only had real roots. What if we have complex roots in our equations? If, for example, we look at the generating function f of x is 1 plus 2x over 1 plus x squared. So if you plug this into a computer algebra system, for example, use SymPy series, or if you do a long division, you see that you get the periodic series shown here. So this series is 1, 2, minus 1, minus 2, and then after the fourth step starts all over again, 1, 2, minus 1, minus 2, and so on. So the period here is 4. So this happens because the roots of the polynomial 1 plus x squared are plus and minus i. And i squared is minus 1, and i cubed is plus 1 again. So this explains the period of 4. But it's also easy to construct a sequence with any period we like. Also note that even with our roots being complex numbers, our sequence elements are still normal real numbers. So this is because if we have a, a real polynomial, come in pairs of plus minus i or complex conjugate pairs and then the result always cancels out the imaginary part and we end up with real values for our function values. Now if you are an electrical engineer, so all these talk about generating functions might have reminded you of something. So in electrical engineering, we already have something similar. This is the so-called Z-transform. The Z-transform is very similar to generating functions. Instead of a polynomial in X, we have a polynomial in Z to the power of minus 1. Well, actually, a lot of authors use uh, Z for generating functions as well. But in order not to confuse you, so I tried to stick with the variable x for generating functions and the variable z for the z-transform. But of course you can use any, any variable and name it any way you want. Here we see the z-transform of a series of all ones. It's 1 over 1 minus z to the power of minus 1, and you can reformulate this as z over z minus 1. If you talk with computer scientists or mathematicians, so they will mostly use generating functions. If we talk with electrical engineers, so then they will most likely already know the z-transform. The z-transform has its origins in the Laplace transform. The Laplace transform is actually similar to what we did with generating functions. If we have a time signal, or usually a signal that is dependent on time, a continuous signal, so we can transfer it to a simple function in the Laplace space just as we transferred a sequence of numbers into a generating function or a z-transform with generating functions or with the z-transform. So if you are interested, 
So the Laplace transform of an impulse at a position in time t equals capital T. So this Laplace transform is e to the power of minus s capital T with some constant capital T where the direct impulse is located. If we have a comp of infinitely many such, such direct pulses, each which with a value of one and each separated by a time capital T, so then this gives the following Laplace transform. If in this formula we replace the term e to the power sd with z, so then we get 1 over 1 minus z to the power of minus 1, which is exactly the transformation of a series of 1s. So you can think of the z transform as the transformation of a series of spikes with an individual value that is the value of the discrete function at that point. Similarly, we can transform back from the Z-transform to the Laplace transform. We then get a series of spikes. If we want to replace the spikes with steps instead, we could multiply our resulting function with these terms and then we get a series of continuous steps. So with the Z-transform we are a little bit more connected to the physical reality of a signal in time and this is kind of important when doing, for example, the digital signal processing. So the digital filter consists of a microprocessor. The microprocessor has an input and the input reads data at a certain sample rate. So for example, one input each millisecond. So in the formula below, these input values are denoted x, x n minus k means the input value at step n that is k times old. We only want to use the last m input values to construct the output values. And each of the input values is multiplied by a, con by a constant bk to construct the output value. So a simple example would be to store the last five input values and then to calculate the average over these five values. In this case, the b values would each be 0 0.2. Or maybe we want a weighted average where we want to give more relevance to the last input values than those that are already 5 or 10 points in the past. Expressed in the terms of the Z-transform, so we have a polynomial BK that stores these values that we want to use for averaging over the last values. This we could directly generate an output, but we could also say, well, since we already computed the output, we could remember the last, let's say, five or ten outputs that we have calculated and also use it in future calculations. So in the formula below, the output values would be y. yn is the output value that we currently send out and yn minus i would be the output value that we have calculated i ages ago. As with the input values, we can assign each of the previous output values a certain factor ai. So for example, if we would want to have the average of the last three output values, all the AIs would be one third and we only would have three AI values.
terms of the generating function or in terms of the Z-transform. So again, we can represent the values AI with a polynomial. Conveniently, we have a minus sign in the computation that uses the last output values. So we can bring the last output values times the A polynomial to the left hand side. And this gives the following equation. Y of Z times A of Z is X of Z times B of Z. So where Y is the Z transform of the output, X is the Z transform of the input, and A of Z and B of Z are the polynomial that represent the coefficients that we used in the above formula. From this, it's only a division to create the so-called transfer function, which represents the relationship between input and output. Y of Z divided by X of Z is B of Z divided by A of Z, or output function Y of Z is X of Z times this transfer function. Now all of this is a little bit of a detour. It helps to generate some understanding of how this Z transform and how the generating functions can be useful. So now let's go back to our two-dimensional grid. Up until now, we only had 1D functions that we transferred with the Z-transform or with generating functions to a simple function that represents the coefficients. But of course, we can extend this method to two dimensions. If we have, for example, a 2D function that is defined on grid points, like our infinite grid of one ohm resistors, and each function value at the position m and n is called fmn. So then we can do a two-dimensional generating function f of x and y and the coefficients of the polynomial at the positions x to the power of m and y to the power of n represent exactly these function values. So the below function would have a value of f0,0 in the middle, and then a value of f1,0, and this is written as f1,0 times x, and in order to represent the value of f0,1, we have a multiplication by y. And so the diagonal point f11 would be the coefficient at x times y in this two-dimensional polynomial. So here we have a way of representing the values in our infinite grid of one ohm resistors. We use a two-dimensional generating functions in x and y, and the values on the grid are just the coefficients at the respective uh, terms in the polynomial. My hope was that equipped with this knowledge, it should be easy to solve the problem of the infinite resistor in the my hope was that equipped with these tools, it should be easy to solve our original problem. It turns out that it's not as simple as I hoped, but still, I hope it was interesting to learn all of this. And in the next section, we will really solve the problem. So stay tuned and see you next time.